dirt, dirt, everywhere you look. They're digging everywhere. They're really doing it. But I'm so tired of crying, but I'm out on the road again. I'm on the road again. We know you don't really believe it. We know who you are. We've done studies. I'm Arnie Reisman. Most of you still think the building of the Third Harbor Tunnel and the depression of the Central Artery are still dreams on drawing boards, which means most of you are not spending too much time around Logan Airport, Commonwealth Flats in South Boston, City Square in Charlestown, the Downtown Financial District, or even that straight line from Dorchester Avenue to Congress Street. If these are your haunts, then you know the big dig is on. Soon, everybody will know. For the next decade, we will all witness and try to endure an upheaval in Boston that will change the face of the city. The new Harbor Tunnel will link the Massachusetts Turnpike to the airport and the North Shore. The South Boston Hall Road will take trucks off neighborhood streets and out of the congested South Station Tunnel. All traffic to and from the Tobin Bridge will travel through tunnels under City Square. The dangerous S-curve, known to provoke much gnashing of teeth and metal, in going to the Tobin from the Central Artery will be eliminated. And of course, the Central Artery itself will be eliminated. The 40-year-old structural homage to upward immobility will be dismantled and replaced with an underground throughway stretching from North Station to South Station, a mile-long tunnel under the city. There's even some talk about digging deeper down under this corridor so that trains can travel below the cars. And when all this construction is completed, they plan to top off the area with more than 20 acres of parkland. The tone for such development has been set by the handsome revitalization of Post Office Square, an oasis for meals and meditation in the middle of downtown Boston. This whole venture has become the nation's largest public works project. For nearly $7 billion, a sum that expands with changes, the Big Dig calculates out at about a billion dollars a mile. Who's paying for this? Interestingly enough, just about every single American. Federal highway taxes will cover around 85% of this high ticket item. The Big Dig will mean 15,000 new jobs. It'll also mean 15,000 headaches. You can't blast a new pathway through a whole lot of nests without ruffling feathers. They found out that much 40 years ago when they put up the central artery. But this time out, they want everybody to be happy. It's called the politics of mitigation like that design for the Charles River Crossing. It's been everything from Plan A to Scheme Z. And it keeps getting stuck between the rock of aesthetics and the hard place of environmental impact. But they keep telling us, eventually, everybody will be happy. Or satisfied, I guess. Since funding for the artery part of this project is tied to the crossing, construction for the depression has not yet been given the green light. It's off the red light, mind you. It's just stuck on yellow, where it will stay until everyone comes together on a crossing design. So let's take a look at what's really happening now and what's on tap for the next few months. On May 11, 1993, 500 interested business people gathered at the Federal Reserve Bank to listen to State Transportation Secretary James Karasiotis update the scorecard at a Project Pep rally. 1993 is looking like a, uh, a banner year in terms of project milestones and achievements. 90% of the project is in final design. Utility relocation is underway in downtown Boston. And the South Boston Hall Road, which is going to be the first major piece of construction to be completed, will be completed this fall. We're continuing construction in South Boston and East Boston on the Third Harbor Tunnel approaches. And by the end of this year, all of the binocular tubes which make up the Third Harbor Tunnel will be positioned in the harbor. In addition, we've awarded contracts for uh, the Cano Loop ramps and anticipate access to the Tobin Bridge as early as this summer and a connection between I-93 and the Tobin by fall of 1994. As you can see, things are moving along and we're beginning to see the face of a 21st century city, preparing itself for the economic and environmental demands of a rapidly changing world. That's four major elements he highlighted, four major elements in this joint venture of Massachusetts and the engineering combine of Bechtel Parsons Brinkerhoff, 
working under the watchful eye of the Federal Highway Administration. Let's take a look at them one at a time. The Third Harbor Tunnel is already halfway through completion. It will consist of 12 binocular tube sections, two lanes going east, two lanes going west. They are manufactured at the Bethlehem Steel Shipyard in Baltimore and floated up here at the rate of one a month. Six of these steel and concrete tubes, each 325 feet long, 80 feet wide, and 40 feet deep, have been embedded and covered in a trench on the harbor floor. One of the world's largest dredging cranes, the Super Scoop, is out there every day working that trench, which stretches just about three quarters of a mile between Subaru Pier in South Boston and the Bird Island Flats at Logan Airport. At full length, the tunnel will run about 1.6 miles, making it a bit longer than Sumner or Callahan. Before it's floated out in a lay barge and lowered into the trench, each tube gets outfitted at Black Falcon Pier next to Subaru Pier. Work goes on at three tubes in increasing degrees of detail. The more work done on the four-lane tunnel section, the more it sinks into the harbor. In May, we had the opportunity to descend into these steel tubes and watch them change into submerged concrete highways. Stan Haas is the resident engineer overseeing this project for the Massachusetts Highway Department. Well, after the tube sections are brought in from Baltimore and they're, and they're offloaded from the sinking barge, uh, the first thing that we'll do is to um, construct the safety rigging that has to go on the tubes, on the top of the tubes, to facilitate workmen's access to and from the tubes. These are handrails and ladders and stairways and the, and the, and the ramps that, that allow you to access the, the tube. After that's in place, the first piece of work that will go on is the installation of what's known as the low haunch, which is the haunch section concrete which is below the roadway and makes up the two side walls of the supply air plenum. This is the first placement of concrete to go inside the tubes. Uh, the haunches are placed first, and then the next placement is the roadway placement, which is the slab that you'll ride on. The next placement is the, uh, the low walls, which are the arch walls on, this, on the side, either side. These are the walls that will be eventually tiled when the finished contractor moves in. And then the last concrete placement inside the tube is the upper arch. And then we'll place that, and, uh, and each of them will work in progression from one end of a barrel to the other, and uh, as they're finished out within that barrel, the forms are removed from, from the tube and placed in the next tube. And it's sort of like a progression, like a con uh, conveyor system of progression of, of concrete placements. Tom Lemon is a concrete superintendent for Morrison Knudsen, one of the three firms putting together the tunnel. He has spent 30 years in construction work. I've done bridges and buildings, and, and it's, it's an honor to be here on this tube. Uh, this is my first one, and I... And it's very nice. It's very nice. It takes anywhere from uh, nine to ten weeks to complete a uniform a tube to put it in the lay barge. So, uh, and we just started on this. This is the first one. This is the first pour in this particular tube. We pump it down to, through the openings uh, with a pump, concrete pump, and uh, we have a 50-foot hose that reaches down in here. And uh, and as you see, these little openings here. Uh, Sometimes we remove a light to, to bring it down into the openings and uh, pour it from there. You see, you, you start on one side, you have to keep the tube level. So we make a pour on, on the west side, which we are standing now, and then the next pour will be on the east side. And you start from uh, one end of the tube with one pour and this other end of the tube. So we keep the pours going like this and keep the tube even. So after the concrete, all the interior concrete is placed and the hatches are sealed shut and inspected, and all the welds are inspected, uh, the tube is then uh, ballasted. In other words, the exterior concrete is placed on it uh, at, at the Black Falcon Pier. Then the tube is loaded into the lay barge, threaded between two large pontoons, and restrained with cables. The tube is encased with enough concrete to give it what they call negative buoyancy. In short, if you cut a cable, the tube would sink. After we've given it about 1,200 tons of negative buoyancy and, and we're ready for placement, the tube is towed out to the, uh, to the location in the harbor where it's supposed to go over the trench, which has been dredged and prepared. And then uh, once we're anchored in position and we're sure that we're in our right place, and this is done by survey, 
uh, were in position, and then they let off of the cables, and the tube slowly sinks to the bottom by itself. Once the tube is entrenched, its bulkhead is removed, and it's joined to the previously placed tube in an airtight fashion. If you have any doubts about traveling through such a structure, keep in mind the Fort McHenry Tunnel in Baltimore and the I-664 Tunnel in Norfolk, Virginia, are just two other examples of immersed tube tunnels on the East Coast. Granted, this is certainly not the way they used to build them. More than 60 years ago, when they started the Sumner Tunnel, they had to bore through bedrock under the harbor to create that shaft we now sit in during what's ironically called rush hours. Even though the Sumner had half as many lanes as the Third Harbor Tunnel, it took nearly twice as long to finish it. It wreaked a little havoc through some neighborhoods in the process, too. It opened in 1934, serving as the only harbor access to the airport for an entire generation, until that other hotbed of bedrock, the Callahan, opened in 1961. Now it's facelift time for both of these aging structures. The Massachusetts Turnpike Authority, which operates these tunnels, has decided to deal with the deterioration and corrosion in the Callahan first. So, from now up until the spring of 1994, the Callahan will be closed from Monday through Friday from 11 p.m. to 5.30 a.m. During those hours, the Sumner reverts to its original status, a two-way traffic tube. Meanwhile, on the East Boston side of these tunnels, Work continues at a fairly rapid pace on Massport property to make way for the new tunnel. Here, several contractors are involved with clearing the corridor and relocating utilities. At Porter Street, Quincy contractor J.M. Cashman's crew is busily rerouting the sewer system and replacing the old pipe with new concrete forms. My name's Melinda Seward. I'm an operating engineer, and I'm running the vibratory hammer. My name is Michelle Smith, and I'm a pile driver, also a student welder. Before she can weld professionally, Michelle has to finish an apprenticeship. Now, why did you want to enter a career of welding? <laughs> well, um, I enjoyed it in school, in high school, in middle school. And um, I didn't like the office job, and I always wanted to be outdoors. So I got into this, and I like it. I love it, really. My great-grandfather, my grandfather, my father were all in Local 4, branch of the International Union of Operating Engineers. And uh, when affirmative action came along and they uh, started taking in women to meet their quotas, my dad called me up and said, uh, well, they have to take in women, so you might as well be one of them. And I'm the only kid in my family that didn't go to college and because I never really knew what I wanted to do and, until my father called me that night. Working outdoors uh, has always been something I enjoy, just like Michelle. I, I'd like to be outside all the time. And when he came up with that, it was like I couldn't get there fast enough. There's nothing else I really wanted to do. Like she said, when the opportun opportunity was there, she took it, I took it too. I just like joking around with the guys and, you know, like being outdoors. Um, it's just fun to me. You know, when I first started, I thought it was going to be really hard. I mean, you would look at it and say, well, I can't do that. But um, come in, just jump right in. The guys make me feel right at home. I mean, they don't treat me like an outsider or anything. How are the opportunities? you think they're getting better? Well, um, I'm working and I'm very grateful. And I'm working on a job where I'm getting top rate, so that's, that's good. I would like the opportunity to get on a crane, but I'll take what I can get. I own a, a cherry picker of my own up in New Hampshire, and I've been running it for the past five years. It's called Dame Crane Service. The guys around here keep calling it a pink crane, but you have some other expression. Well, it's it's not pink. It, the crane is black. It has raspberry chiffon wheels, actually. The wheels? Yes, the wheels are raspberry chiffon, and it has pink lettering. You guys have any idea what this whole thing is going to look like when this is done? I don't, I don't, have, an, I don't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> it's not all that unusual anymore to have women in construction 
particularly on the Big Dig. They're highly visible. Project contracts require 25% minority and 7% women for on-site workforce participation. These goals constitute a far cry from the makeup of the crew working on the old Sumner. But they didn't believe in working with hard hats back then either. In that era, women found employment in construction, manufacture, and other blue-collar situations, primarily during wartime, when men were sent overseas to hoist M1s instead of I-beams. Today, it's a different world. Just ask Michelle or Melinda. But don't bother them until they've finished their job. By that time, and by the time the repairs on the Callahan and Sumner have been completed, the Third Harbor Tunnel will have reached a milepost. By April of 1994, we will have removed the final bulkhead and we'll be able to, uh, to move uh, or by, uh, by foot anyway from uh, South Boston to, uh, to East Boston. And uh, at that point in time, all of the finish work that goes on within the tunnel will, uh, will uh, be underway and uh, we'll be opening the tunnel sometime in the spring of 1995. The um, tunnel will be open for commercial vehicles and uh, probably high occupancy vehicles during, uh, during the 1995 to, say, 1998 uh, time frame, simply because we, uh, we need to complete the interchange up here uh, to our north at 1A, and we need to complete the connections between the, uh, the turnpike um, and uh, I-93 and the uh, Third Harbor Tunnel. So uh, uh, during a period of time uh, the, between 1995 and 1998, the, uh, the facility will be open to, uh, to a smaller uh, number of vehicles. But uh, we believe that, that uh, as soon as we get the uh, facility open, and that we'll take about 18% of the traffic off of the existing artery. What this means is 18% of the traffic will no longer have to drive through downtown Boston to get to Logan or anywhere to the north. What this also means is if you want to try out the new tunnel before 1998 and you don't have commercial plates, start a slush fund for cabs and buses. The tunnel essentially ends on the airport in the vicinity of where the Eastern Airlines hangar used to be. That's sort of a landmark in the area near, near the Terminal A at Logan Airport. Um, that hangar has been demolished by us in order to build the, build the roadway system. So when you come out of the tunnel over here on airport property, you'll have the freedom of dashing to a plane or continuing right on up to Route 1A without ever paying a toll. That's because they'll get you on the return trip instead. All westbound motorists heading for the tunnel will have to pass through a system of electronic surveillance over here. It'll be a toll plaza, and it will be fully equipped to discourage non-commercial drivers for the first four years, while it encourages anyone who uses AVI, automatic vehicle identification. Welcome to the 21st century. In essence, what it is is a method of, of reading, a, reading a card. Vehicles that use the toll plaza will be able to get a card that they stick in their car, and there will be a beam that shoots out and reads information off this card. Essentially, people will not have to stop and give money to a toll collector. They'll be able to go through at speeds of up to 30, 30 or so miles an hour and go through the tolls without having to slow down and stop. Um, this is a technology that's being used around the country. Um, actually, right here in Boston, up on um, the Tobin Bridge, the new toll plaza is going to have that technology. And again, the regular visitor will be able to um, get this card, and it'll, it'll go into a, a budget system, a debit system, that they'll be able to pay it. There'll also be regular tolls, so the people who uh, either are visitors or regular people who just want to go through the tunnel every once in a while won't have to get that card. They'll be able to stop and pay a person like a normal toll plaza. And if you try to zoom through the toll plaza without the right card or the right plates, you'll find yourself having to answer to the police. The only question here is, to whom will the police have to answer? Which one of our many quasi-public, semi-private authorities will eventually operate this new tunnel system? Obviously, we'd like to tie in the Third Harbor Tunnel, the um, existing uh, depressed artery, and uh, uh, to bring all of the tolling facilities under one entity or one umbrella would be the, the, uh, the ideal objective, and that's what we're going to try to accomplish. I, I think that uh, Massport is uh, uh, an ideal candidate to be an operator. Um, the Third Harbor Tunnel services their facility. The existing harbor tunnels service their facility. Um, I think that it's a natural tie-in for the Port Authority to look at an operation like this and take it over. 
What does Massport think of this? At the time of this taping, Alden Rain was the executive director. The legislature and the governor will, uh, will have to make the call uh, as to whether uh, the highway department, the port authority, the turnpike authority, or somebody else uh, actually runs it. Uh, I would expect and hope that we'd be substantially involved one way or the other uh, because of the obvious interface between the tunnel and the airport and the tunnel and the seaport. What about the turnpike authority? After all, they run the Sumner and the Callahan, and I-90, that are known as the Mass Pike, will soon be extended to connect with the Third Harbor Tunnel. Clearly, we need some help from the Turnpike Authority. Uh, they have uh, substantial resources that can help the Commonwealth to solve a lot of transportation problems. And I think that given, their, uh, given the strength of their balance sheet, it makes sense for them to come forward and do that. Um, if they choose not to, I don't know what kind of role they could play. One of the issues that, that uh, we have with the Turnpike Authority, in fact, the only issue we have with the Turnpike Authority, is here is an uh, institution that has served a very useful purpose. And right now, we think that it needs to find another useful purpose in order uh, for it to continue to survive. If it can't, then, then we don't see any reason for it to survive. The Massachusetts Turnpike Authority refused to comment on camera for this program. They said that whatever they had to say would most likely be held against them. They characterized their situation with the Transportation Secretary and the Weld Administration as politically delicate, which is just a sweet way of saying they're at war. At the time of this taping, the Turnpike Authority was fighting back with the support of a proposed Democratic amendment to the state budget that would give it control over the Third Harbor Tunnel. A spokesperson for the Weld Camp called this move a typical Democratic power grab, adding they wish the authority would kind of go away instead of take more routes. When the House actually passed the budget on May 29th, Democrats yanked this amendment out at the last minute. It never saw the light of day in the Senate vote either. The picture of life at Logan may be murky for the powers at the Pike, but it's essentially rosy for some other folks besides the contractors. There's a brand new Hyatt Hotel at the end of the airport's Harborside Drive where the water shuttle docks. With its spectacular views of Rose Wharf and other highlights of the city's waterfront, the hotel could easily become a major attraction for weddings, graduation parties, and other bond voyages. Over on the other side of Logan, they're going to build a pedestrian access to East Boston's Memorial Stadium, so ball players and their fans will no longer have to play dodge em with all the traffic. It's bad enough trying to field a pop-up and get blinded by the shiny underside of a 747. As another favor for East Boston, they're going to remove the park and fly lot, which now holds over a thousand cars on Bremen Street, and replace it with a more bucolic idea of the word park a much-needed neighborhood swatch of grassland. In a land swap arrangement, Park and Fly will take up residence on airport property as the only private vendor of parking spaces. It will be one of the first sites when you emerge from the tunnel. By the way, when you're in that airtight tunnel, you will have air to breathe, thanks to a well-placed ventilation system. Can you explain what we're standing in? <laughs> we're standing in a, uh, a coffer dam that was constructed to facilitate the construction of a future ventilation building, ventilation building number six, which is in South Boston. This coffer dam at the Marine Industrial Park near Subaru Pier has been under construction for over a year. When you're on the bottom floor, it's like standing in a bull ring, except this arena has been dug about 100 feet down into waterlogged soil. It's been pumped dry and made watertight. The circular concrete walls, which hold back the water, range from six feet thick on one side to 11 feet thick on the other. At the end of this year, the last tube will be fitted right through the thickest section. It will join the Seaport Access Road tunnel coming across South Boston. They'll meet in the middle of the coffer dam. There will be a ventilation building built in here. It will sit on top of the tunnels which service the connection from the Seaport Access Road through the immersed tube tunnels to Logan Airport. We're currently standing in Commonwealth Flats in South Boston. Keith Sibley, a resident engineer for Bechtel Parsons Brinkerhoff, oversees the construction of the cut and cover tunnel section of the Seaport Access Road that ends in the coffer dam. Cut and cover basically means they dig a trench and put a roof over it. He traced the proposed roadway for us. I-90 will cross under the commuter railroad tracks behind South Station. It will come under the Fort Point Channel. It will come under the parking lot in front of the Gillette Company and under A Street. As it comes closer to us across Commonwealth Flats, it comes up behind me here under Viaduct Street, arcing right through the middle of Commonwealth Flats, Massport property here, 
crossing through the corner of the Boston Marine Industrial Park under Northern Avenue, and it meets the end of the immersed tube tunnel at the edge of the water there in the harbor. This seaport access road, to be accomplished in sections, will be years in the making. On the other hand, one link off this roadway, as Secretary Karasiotis noted, should be ready by this fall. This is the Hall Road, a limited two-lane route for trucks and buses built under the bridges of South Boston along the old Conrail tracks between Dorchester Avenue and Congress Street. This road, which is designed to take 4,500 trucks a day off residential streets, is now in the final phases of drainage and paving. Resident engineer Carol Hebb explained the preparation. The fabric that you've seen going down here is called a filter fabric. The hall road is built very close to the water table, and we're concerned that as the water comes up through the roadway, it can freeze in the winter and it can break up the pavement, which uh, is obviously undesirable. This is a special design to put an open stone layer to catch that water and drain it off to the side before it can get into the actual roadway structure. And this fabric is placed to keep the small, fine particles that are above and below this, this drainage layer from clogging up the drainage layer. It runs the full distance of the hall road um, above and below this layer and around all the drainage pipes which is about a mile, and the drainage pipes are on both sides of the road. Right to the manhole. Right to the manhole. Right to the manhole. What you'll see next is uh, the, the actual forming of the cross section of the road. It has to be very carefully graded to drain the road. Uh, that's one of the reasons the drainage system works. Uh, it's, it's called a crown that we place in the road. It's usually down the center line of the road. It slopes off in both sides, and when it gets to the shoulders, it slopes at a different grade. Um, usually a sharper grade to make sure that when the water gets to the side of the travel path, it actually drives down into the drainage. And what we see is the compacting equipment. There are actually two machines that get used. One of them is a very heavy roller that does the main part of the road. But because the shoulder's so narrow in the Hall Road cut, we have a smaller thing called a whacker that's just a little small push roller that'll pick up the edge as it goes around the structures. It does the small things. At about the time the Hall Road is finished in September, Utility relocation, which began last year, will go into full swing in and around the downtown financial district. For many doing business in Boston, waiting for this to happen has been like waiting for the other shoe to drop. Fear of detours and disruption ranks high on the list of downtown anxieties. Yet much of the work will occur below street level and at night as they move around old pipes, lines and conduits connected to telephones, electricity, gas, thermal, water, sewer service, and cable television. All this has to be done in preparation for the eventual depression of the central artery. And some of this work will be going on until 1996. No utility lines are going to be uh, uh, disrupted um, while the new utilities are being placed. And um, uh, during the course of the construction, obviously, while planning has taken place for several years on, um, on how to construct a project like this without disrupting business, without hurting people in terms of their ability to rent space and in terms of getting their people in and out of work, uh, there are going to be things that are going to come up during the course of the construction that we're going to have to manage. Hence that fear. So far, they've been managing. For openers, since last February, workers have been relocating a 30-inch gas main from the Custom House Broad Street intersection at night. They're moving it along High, Purchase, and Battery Mart streets and hope to finish by the end of the year. Battery March is one of those classic Boston cow paths that meanders in such a haphazard way that you can actually end up on the corner of Battery March and Battery March. What's also special about this street is the diggings in daylight, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., Monday through Friday. If you're driving, you'll have to go around Battery March and avoid all but the high street end of it. Utility relocation will continue along both sides of the artery surface road, while a new east-west corridor for pipes, wires, and lines will be constructed near the junction of Clinton and Commercial Streets. Starting this fall, this undertaking will require about two and a half years. Some of this work can only be done in an open trench, which stops traffic. But sometimes a sewer line, for example, can be moved through a trenchless tunneling technique called jack piping. This was successfully executed at the Mass Pike Southeast Expressway interchange. A survey of downtown area businesses found the loss of telephone-related services to rank right up there as the highest anxiety. As New England Telephone relocates 200,000 miles of copper and fiber cable, it's trying to take every measure to prevent massive outbreaks of screaming and hair pulling 
over disrupted phone calls, fax transmissions, or electronic money transfers. This is the 1200 pair cable here that uh, we're going to be cutting over that feeds us into the Quincy market area. Here's a small cable that comes out this end and another small cable out this end. They probably go to these buildings right adjacent to us here. And when I go back to the office, I'll check them out on our records to make sure uh, where they go and that we, uh, we pick up every service in the area. At the Network Operations Center in Framingham, New England telephone workers monitor all the lines throughout the region. This highly sophisticated system will allow them immediate identification of trouble spots during the big dig. What we want to look at first of all, Phone service beyond the year 2000 will be carried by fiber optic cables here at the Cambridge Central Office, also known as the vault. These empty metal shelves once carried miles of copper phone line. They are now being replaced with those new fiber optic cables. John McHugh is operations manager for New England Telephone. Here's the fiber optics cable as they come in to our distribution frames. And what we do when we bring these in here is we terminate them on a connector shelf. And we take the fiber optic connectors, and if you can get a shot of that, believe it or not, there's a hair thin fiber right there. And two of these little fibers can carry, oh, approximately 16,000 customer conversations, data circuits, and the equivalent video circuits and, and fax circuits and anything else in the telecommunications industry that you can think of. This new capability should make the move of circuits from the artery area over to the loop around the city a manageable task. One pulled plug, hopefully the right one, and the old system gives way to the new. All right, now, um, Lexington, Brockton, you ready to roll this? All right, on my count of three, one, Two, three. Okay, I see clean banks both what you see it clean. All right. Even if we don't lose phone service during this construction phase, you know we can't say the same for traffic access and parking spaces. But there might be some blessings here. For example, the Northern Avenue on-ramp to the Central Artery northbound, where three lanes of traffic convulse rather than converge will be relocated to High Street. Information about further road closings and new parking and general mayhem will be provided by the Central Artery Project through newspaper inserts and telephone hotlines. Look at it this way. By the time they begin jackhammering and jackpiping down here this fall, life is scheduled to get smoother over at the Tobin Bridge and at City Square in Charlestown. This is the Central Artery North area. That's C-A-N-A, or CANA project. This is a plan to eliminate one of our greatest concentrations of highway havoc, to unsnarl the four tentacles of traffic that like to arm wrestle one another over the Charles River. The idea was to find a way to improve the traffic flow from the Tobin, I-93, Starro Drive, and the Central Artery while improving life in Charlestown. To accomplish their aims, project engineers built two tunnels under City Square. The northbound tunnel, feeding local traffic onto the Tobin, should be open this summer. The southbound tunnel is slated to open this fall. They've even provided overhead screens on the tunnel ends to help you adjust your eyes from light to dark and vice versa. A nice touch. When Cana is completed, all Tobin traffic will travel through these tunnels. The nail-biting approach to the bridge from the artery will just be a bad memory. Funded as a separate project, Cana construction began six years ago, but has been slowed by the havoc and snarling that has delayed the design approval for the Charles River Crossing, which has to connect with Cana. But the people who ride this river roller coaster and the people who live under it feel they've waited long enough in the shadows of a half-finished project. So now, the Weld Administration has gotten off the dime, figuring on a timetable that gives them the green light on the crossing design in 1994 they will need about another eight years after that to build the new crossing, put the artery underground, dismantle the old one, pave new surface roads, seed new parklands, and open for business. In short, they decided, why wait? Let's finish Canaan now and worry how it fits into the grand scheme when there is one. Peter Zook is the director of the Central Artery Project. What we are uh, doing in the Cana area is erecting temporary loop ramp viaducts, which will double the ability uh, of that K 
Kena system, which is just being completed to receive traffic from the Mystic Tobin Bridge, will go from a one ramp to a two ramp uh, ability to put traffic onto the existing artery both north and south. And that will be in place for some seven to ten years while uh, we work on the uh, other portions of the Central Artery Project and finally build a new permanent Charles River Crossing late uh, in the Central Artery Project. These temporary loop ramps, which will allow for full use of the tunnels, will be completed by the end of 1994, approximately six months after a new crossing design is approved. Hopefully. When they finally build the crossing to connect Cana with an underground artery, it might look something like this. While Cana is now the only major development happening north of the river, the only significant change now in progress on the south side is the creation of the new Boston Garden. Ceremonious groundbreaking began on Causeway Street behind the old home of the Celtics and Bruins on April 28th. They're slated to play in their new home in the fall of 95. And whoever believes the new garden will be popularly known as the Shawmut Center should be convicted of wishful thinking and sentenced to Cedar Junction. The new Boston Garden is one of the success stories that comes out of the Artery Tunnel Project. Uh, and it illustrates the way that the central artery is a lifeline for development along the artery for economic activity in the city. First of all, uh, a portion of the funds that will be used to build the new Boston Garden are funds made available by the Federal Highway Administration to the artery project. And that's really the job of the artery, uh, to be a transportation system which services uh, development along uh, the central artery and through the center of the city of Boston. That funding has sure been a lifeline, all right. You have to understand something. We're getting about one-third of the entire national highway construction budget for the big dig. Each state contributes federal gasoline taxes for this budget. Nearly half the states pay in a lot more than they ever get back. But because of the big dig, Massachusetts will be getting back about $2.50 for every dollar it puts in. So if you're waiting around for, like, federal relief for your uh, water bills, don't hold your breath. We've had our turn at the well. Now before we go to the back of the line, let's remember how we got this bucket. It came with the passage 10 years ago of a congressional bill labeled by one of its opponents, North Carolina Senator Jesse Helms, as a Tip O'Neill Christmas party. The speaker led the rest of the state's delegation in mounting a strong campaign to win interstate highway financing. All of us in the delegation know that uh, Tip's involvement and was absolutely uh, indispensable. I think we've been fortunate in having a, a good uh, partnership in working together and we're, we were always uh, glad to be one of uh, Tip O'Neill's foot soldiers. We, uh, we miss him and uh, we're going to continue what uh, uh, he started and what all of us worked on. Once the bill passed the House, it took a rough ride through the Senate where it was crushed by both the Reagan and Bush teams. By Thanksgiving, 1991, Kennedy felt he had one last chance before a holiday recess to win approval, and that involved getting Helms or his fellow senator from North Carolina, Terry Sanford, to see the wisdom in upgrading Boston's roadways. Our principal opponent was uh, Jesse Helms of North Carolina, and uh, he was complaining about the cost, even though his own state had been well taken care of in terms of the, uh, their own interstate needs. And, uh, so in the course of the debate, I was, uh, sometimes in these debates, you use, try and use a little bit of humor and pointing out that uh, all of the trucks, the 18-wheelers that were going to come up from North Carolina and sell tobacco products uh, wouldn't be able to get through Boston because of the congestion. And uh, they wouldn't be able to service their outlets in, uh, in northern uh, New England. And, um, and we were able to persuade Terry Sanford to uh, change his position, uh, convincing him that to maintain that position was not only was going to basically disrupt uh, the completion of the whole interstate system and that uh, historically people in Boston, New England were, had that to commitment to move ahead and, and, uh, and he switched uh, his vote, supported it. We won it by one vote. So there was Tip O'Neill's pull in the House and Ted Kennedy's push in the Senate. And there were also instrumental tugs along the way from Fred Salvucci, the former State Secretary of Transportation, and from Congressman Joe Moakley, whose district encompasses all the construction. And in the waning days of the Bush administration, Bill Well took over this building, and it was party time, Republican party time. The Washington establishment was now being hit from both sides. All these efforts paid off. 
and Massachusetts was awarded enough federal funding to cover about 85 percent of the artery and tunnel projects. The question now is, how are we going to pay for the rest of it? The funds for the state share of this project are funds which are raised through gasoline taxes, uh, which are paid by uh, motorists using the roadways in Massachusetts. All right, so every time we fill up our tanks, we're contributing to all this construction. But those taxes aren't enough to take care of the operation and maintenance of the artery and tunnel when they're finished, are they? Of course, there will be those tolls at the New Harbor Tunnel. Then you have to add to the cost concerns the mystery element. What it may take to take away all this dirt, the natural byproduct of the big dig, will accumulate in record-breaking mounds over several areas of the city. By the time they're actually tunneling the artery, this project will have unearthed more than 12 million cubic yards of dirt. When they asked for disposal bids this spring, Zook and the project managers were shocked to receive two offers at $200 million, tripling the project's estimate. While they rethink and re-ask, the digging continues. Peter Glover is the area construction manager who makes dirt his business. The material that we see behind me in South Boston is being presently excavated for, for the approaches to the Third Harbor Tunnel. Uh, the, the material is being stockpiled here. We also have similar material over on the East Boston side at the other portal entrance. Analysis for contamination and toxicity takes place right at the sites. Some of the dirt, basically clay, sand, and gravel, is transported to and examined at a Northern Avenue site opposite Pier 4. 2.7 million cubic yards, nearly 25% of all this dirt, is earmarked for Spectacle Island sitting out in Boston Harbor. Spectacle Island has had a varied life and, and one of the major uh, activities which has shaped Spectacle over the last 80 years was a landfill operation. Um, presently that landfill is leaching out uh, liquid into the harbor and what we are planning to do is to contain that. We're going to enclose the landfill and use our project material to in fact shape it for a park. On a rain-soaked visit to Spectacle Island, Ed Ionata, the environmental services manager for Bechtel Parsons Brinkerhoff, explained how they first had to control what's known as leachate. Leachate basically is rainwater that gets in the top, percolates through all the trash that's landfilled here, and comes out the bottom of the island and enters the, the harbor as contaminated water. Before any soil comes out here, it gets tested initially in the ground before we excavate any soil with a, ha with a uh, hazardous waste geotechnical boring program. Go out, drill holes in the ground, find out what kind of soil we have. It gets tested again during excavation. Then it gets a final test at the staging area where they load the barges to be sure that no contaminated soil comes out here. So everything we're bringing out here is tested clean and is good material for capping a landfill. The material that's already here is primarily urban trash uh, from the 1920s through the 1950s. So there's a lot of uh, debris, metal, car batteries, that type of thing. More than 300 years ago, the island actually looked like a pair of spectacles. Its colorful history began as two glacial drifts joined by a sandbar. People first went out there to plant food and take its timber. Then for 20 years, they quarantined sufferers of yellow fever out there. The hospital then gave way to picnic grounds. In 1847, two resort hotels lured folks from the mainland with gambling. Ten years later, they lured the police and resort life dried up. The next 50 years were dominated by a business that processed horses into hair, hides, and glue. This gave way to a plant that processed just garbage. Soon, everyone was dumping everything here. The island filled out so that it now resembles a potato on a bad day. And the garbage, now about 100 feet deep, is about to give way to those picnic grounds again. When this is finished, it will be uh, a park for passive recreation, hiking, uh, also good wildlife habitat on most of the island, and some active recreation areas such as athletic fields. Also, uh, some plans in development for boating and marina aspects. A subsequent contract will come along and put the park amenities in. Those are yet to be finalized in design and it's uh, out in probably 19, late 1996, early 1997, when construction of the park amenities 
will take place. Well, that takes care of some of the dirt, but where's all the rest of it going? Another large quantity will be going out to the ocean to, for, di for disposal out there. That is the clean, native material that, was, that would be dredged in and around the project. The material that was dumped in the harbor over the last 300, 350 years, which is what we call historic fill, that material can be reused, uh, beneficially reused at landfills. And the clay, the clean clay that we would excavate beneath that fill can also be reused at landfills to cap and line uh, landfills in, in Massachusetts. In fact, we now have a state environmental law requiring the capping, lining, or containing of all our landfill sites. That should take care of a considerable amount of dirt. After all, landfill is our middle name. Lest we forget, about 80% of what we call Boston was once water. So we could have transportation systems and an airport we filled in our harbor. Even before that, we used landfill to create East Boston, South Boston, Back Bay, and Charlestown. Federal laws now prohibit us from using any more landfill to stretch our borders. Massachusetts does have a lot of landfills that do require closure at the present time and in the next uh, few years. And this project will provide uh, a considerable amount of material that, that's required to close those landfills. Even if this capping and closing consumed all 12 million cubic yards of dirt, think of what we may be creating with the delivery chores. When you consider the size of a load each hauler can carry, that could mean we would be putting about an extra 750,000 truckloads into our traffic swirl. No wonder we need a haul road. And maybe we'll still have dirt left over when we finish with the landfills. Then what? Maybe we should come up with a game show like Dialing for Dirt. We call you and ask a simple question, and if you answer correctly, you can win a nice big mound of freshly turned earth and rocks, delivered free to your door. That way the city can get rid of its dirt faster, and you can always expand a garden or build a patio. Then again, maybe there's even a faster way. The next time you pass a pile of dirt, think housewarming gift. We all must do our part. One more thing. If they're really serious about digging deeper under the artery to create a rail system linking north and south stations, they'll have even more dirt on their hands. As many of you know, we're also looking very closely at the feasibility of a north-south rail link under the artery alignment. The idea has been around for a long time, and conventional wisdom told us that it couldn't be done. But given the closing window of opportunity as we progress with the artery, we decided to dispense with the conventional wisdom and take a new look. We've just received the final report, and I can tell you that it looks very promising. So promising that Governor Weld actually wants to go ahead with the idea. Whether we actually need it is another story, and another one of those environmental impact studies. Many people now travel to Boston each day by train. It's their way of getting to work without the hassle of dealing with traffic and parking. And since they renovated South Station and filled it with all kinds of foods, the trip has become more inviting and rewarding. But besides these MBTA commuters, the governor's people also want to cater to Amtrak's customers. Come on! Without a rail link, travelers who want to go from Portland, Maine, down to Miami, Florida, by train, have to make one change. They have to get off at North Station and take a cab or a couple of T's to South Station to continue their journey. Of course, there hasn't exactly been riding in the streets over this glitch in the schedule, and Amtrak's not sure there would be a travel boom if the glitch were gone. Would a rail link even attract enough new T riders to justify all the trouble? After all, it will cost an additional estimate of $1.6 billion. And it may also cause further delay in making that artery into a tunnel. We couldn't deal with any delay on the project, and we really couldn't deal with any cost issues. But uh, um, in a, with very minor modifications to our construction by extending the slurry walls, which essentially are going to support the, um, the depressed central artery uh, by about 20 feet, we will be able to accommodate a, um, a rail tunnel that will exist underneath the, uh, the depressed central artery. The chances of actually getting uh, the north-south station rail link uh, without disrupting the timing and, uh, and the physical design of the artery tunnel, uh, not to mention the $1.6 billion, uh, is a pretty serious problem. I think the real kind of question is the funding, uh, both at the federal level as, as well as at the, uh, at the state level. 
the state has serious financial kinds of problems, and any kind of commitment at the uh, at uh, the federal level obviously has to be matched. We've got uh, big uh, uh, matters on our, our plate: the harbor, uh, the, uh, uh, the the tunnel. While the Boston Globe also adds its voice, editorializing against the rail link, and that debate heats up, South Station will still have to prepare itself to accommodate a whole new crowd, airline passengers. The T right now is building a two-story garage uh, on the air rights over the tracks out behind the South Station headhouse. That'll be two stories of parking uh, and intercity bus operations, and it'll also be the foundation for this wonderful Technopolis that Tufts and the BRA uh, are going to eventually build on top of that. When that bus station opens uh, in just about two years, uh, you'll be able to walk into an airport terminal at South Station. Several airlines will, uh, will sell tickets. Uh, as soon as we figure out with FAA the technology of how to get bags through uh, without breaching security, and I'm confident we'll be able to do that, you'll be able to buy your ticket, check your bag, get on a mass port bus, and the beauty of it will be that it will have a special ramp when the entire Third Harbor Tunnel is completed at the turn of the century. There'll be a special ramp that'll come right out the back of South Station, right into the Third Harbor Tunnel, right into the airport roadway system. This is the latest in what they call intermodal thinking. Make all transportation systems within a city connect. Hence that push for the rail link. You know something? This is deja vu. We've been here before. Whether we're talking rail links or picnic grounds, rooting and rerouting, mantling and dismantling, putting up buildings and roads and transportation systems and taking them all down again. We've been doing that in Boston since they invented the bulldozer. And we've survived. Even at the beginning of this century, when Thomas Edison came here to observe and document the native and peculiar habits of Bostonians, we entertained thoughts of change. Our visions were boundless. If we could create a major metropolis with landfill, we could do anything. So, more than 90 years ago, after the L Street Brownies had already established their whimsical tradition of staying healthy by jumping into the frozen waters off South Boston in the dead of winter, we came up with a rail link. That's right, we decided to uglify the city but bring it into the 20th century by putting up an elevated train system that looped its way past stately South Station along Atlantic Avenue through the financial district and downtown and up to North Station and beyond. For more than 40 years, Bostonians traveled in and out of the city by train past the fourth floor windows of merchants and residents. Then, when World War II came along, the rail system was dismantled. It wasn't needed anymore. After all, we had buses and trolleys and cabs. And to be sure, we had cars, lots and lots of cars. Rail links were passe. One of the advantages in tearing down the elevated in the 40s was we could help the war effort and sell the scrap metal to the U.S. military. Spurred on by slogans of patriotism, that's exactly what we did. After all, we all must do our part. Of course, 10 years after we tore this down, we put up the central artery. Now we're about to take that down and put it instead under the street. And below that, we may even bring back the railroad. Keep calm. Our lives will be disrupted. But we've been here before and we've made it. The larger question is, when will we ever finish this city? Delaying tactics can be seen on any horizon. One we can see clearly right now is that rail link. Another is the fight over a location choice for the proposed megaplex with its convention center and football stadium. We'll just have to wait and see. But a lot of life has conditioned us to such waiting. The long-range question has to be, how long can we make changes without damaging the earth beneath us? Will our underpinnings give way to sinkholes? If we keep digging away at our roots, what's the worst that could happen? We might discover Atlantis, or Boston may soon be a major city in South America. If you want to keep in step with the changes that are going to happen, and if you want to know where you can step, you'd be better off staying tuned to us over the next decade. We'll be doing these progress reports to help you stay informed. Whoops! Whoa! Wow, you want to talk, talk sinkholes? sinkholes. What the
the sign said the other way was the wrong way. I think I just slipped into another part of the construction. I'm not wearing a hard hat. I don't, I don't think I'm supposed to be in here. Right. This doesn't look the least bit familiar. Did I just see signs in Spanish? Nah. Wait a minute. That's the Bunker Hill Monument doing in the middle of downtown Boston. And why does this even look like downtown Boston? Take a deep breath. I did fall through something, didn't I? Some of these holes are really deep. I can't believe it. You know, this kind of reminds me of when I was a kid and I'd be in my backyard digging a hole and my mother would try and come out and stop me. And then, you know, she would say things like, you know what's going to happen? If you dig straight down, you're going to go right through the center of the earth and hit China. And, and that just never made sense to me. I mean, if I'm standing in the United States and I'm digging straight down, I'm not going east. I'm going south, right? I mean, don't you think I'm going south if I'm digging straight down? Excuse me? Este señor salió de ahí, de un agujero, así salió, y acá está en Buenos Aires, en la República Argentina. ¿Argentina? Sí. Esta es la diagonal norte, diagonal norte, y acá estamos en Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires? Argentina. ¿Estoy en Argentina? Sí, en Argentina, es el centro, es Buenos Aires. ¿Está donde estoy ahora mismo, Buenos Aires? Buenos Aires, eso es. Sí. ¿No has estado aquí? No, no he estado aquí. Espera un poquitito. Estoy en Buenos Aires. Sí, Buenos Aires. 